All right, good. Oh. Thanks for coming. Thank you so I much. I appreciate for having this me. so much. Uh, cause it's crazy. We met what was that? What was that? Oh four back in Vegas? I mean oh three, oh four. Oh four, yeah. I was in rehab. You were dating Ray Liotta. Yes. Yes. And so like, for a short period of time. For a short period. Okay, all right, whatever. I'm still mad I didn't get to meet him. Uh I did saw yeah. him walk in that strip club that time, but yeah, whatever. We won't talk about that. But like it's cool that you're here because I'm back now. You obviously helped me develop some of my first like offhand racial jokes. So here we are again. I appreciate that. Um, and how soon after we met did we realize we were from the same hometown? Well, I, that I saw you here. Yeah. And I was wondering what you were doing here. Yeah. Uh, you were in, uh, well, I don't, know the re- I don't know the name of the restaurant, but I remember, I was like, whoa. It was like you- a year. Yeah. After, yeah. And so <laughs> that's how we figured out we were from the same hometown. Um, but yeah, that's nuts. And uh, I love that we have caught up because I've been able to learn so much about you that I didn't know during that time. Like, why do you think we just kept all that information from each other? Were we just like having a blast? What? I think that we had no idea that we would have the common threads that we have. And Mm -hmm. so we didn't even think to ask each other those questions back then. And we were, you know, we were Southern people out West trying to drop our accents and do, you know, I mean. Well, it was great because you remember, – remember we used to talk about um, – you used to help me, like I said, first racial jokes and how I used to reverse racism on like <laughs> – you understood what I was talking about <laughs> on reversing racism on like Northeast Jackson soccer moms and yeah. whatnot. Um, I thought that was funny because I took that like in life when I'd come home sometimes. Like if I get on the elevator or something, I'm like, oh, oh God, please, ma'am, please. Here's my wallet. Take everything you need. Please just don't harm me. Don't send me to jail. Or like in grocery stores, sitting there, you know, I see one of those like hoity-toity individuals and um, I like fake a phone call. I'm like, yeah, I can't believe I'm back in Jackson surrounded with these peasants. One lady actually stopped me. One lady actually came up, tapped me on the shoulder. She was like, um, sir, who are you calling peasants? And yeah, I didn't know what to do because I was like, I'm so sorry, ma'am. You, and then ran. It is an interesting place. I have to say of all the places I've lived, it's an interesting, very interesting place. And like, so why did you leave? Well, I left, let's see, 1991 after um, high school, went to college, Ole Miss. And then I just, everybody was marrying their you know, high school and college sweethearts and moving on. And I did not want to do that. And so I met a boy from Texas and it's always Texas, always Texas, big, wide and proud and married him. And we moved. Wait, we got to clarify. You're not talking about like, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm right, not. Good, good, yeah. Good, good. Um, and anyway, that's what, you know, I, I ended up in Texas for a while and then moved to Los Angeles you know, 10 years and. But you didn't, you just didn't want to raise a family here though. I, that is very true. And I, um, you know, my dad was a real estate developer here and long time uh, Jacksonian. And I had to, it was a really hard day that when I went to him and said, I do not want to raise my kids here. And he looked at me, why? And I said, well, even though, You know, my last child was born in 2001. I said, even though we're in the year 2000, I don't see races mixing the way. I don't want my kids to go to school with all white kids. I don't want, it's not that there's anything wrong with that, but I don't, I want my kids to know kids of other races, cultures. You know, I I just want, I want something different. And I, and I personally love the black culture here in Jackson. And I don't, you know, have a single friend that we're really mixing with anybody from that. I'm meeting people in other areas and loving them and finding that they're not being included in our gatherings and in our things. And I just, I want something different for my kids. So I moved to Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I can talk about it. So you have to give me permission if you don't want to, but I remember you telling me a story about your dad and like not working or something till your last kid was out of college. So, I have a very, yeah, I had a very unique thing happen to me. Now, this was when I was 38 years old. So I had already been in Los Angeles working in film. You and I had met. That was all past that. And my dad came to me 
and he said um, he was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. And he said, here's the deal. I would like for you to, I'm going to leave you. I'm clearly going to die. I'm mm-hmm. going to leave you enough money to be comfortable. I don't want you to work until your last child is, has graduated from college because I want you to be there in the morning making their breakfast. I want you to be there packing their lunches. I want you to be running up to the school when they forget something. I want you to pick them up from school. I want you to do the homework and the baths and the dinners and all the things. And I don't want you to be overloaded with something else. I want you fully present. And Mm -hmm. at the time, I remember thinking, you have got to be kidding me. (laughs) What, you mean to have a free ride for like 28 years? Well, I wasn't. At the time, my career was really beginning to build. So I was not looking at it like that. Okay, you didn't tell me that part. Yeah, I was not looking at it like that. I was like, so you're asking me to let go of everything that I've worked for and just be, you know, the the parent to these children. And he said, yes. And in return, I'll take care of you. And so it's my father. I had a lot of respect for my dad. I loved him very much. So I said, absolutely, I will do it. I had no idea the gift that he was giving me. And it wasn't the largest part of it financial. So that's nuts because it reminded me when you told me, like, um, I was in high school and I hit my first home run. Um, and as I was rounding second base, I could see out of the corner of my eye, this, uh, looked like a homeless painter like, <laughs> come running out onto the field. And I saw it was my dad. And I was like, you know, at the time I was like, Oh dad, you're embarrassing me, man. Oh. Cause he came out, he had been working on one of the rental houses. He had yeah. a, he has a number of properties in the city as well. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even know he was at the game. Um, but when he came running out to meet me at third with a high five, with one of the hugest smiles on his face, I did understand it then, but I get it now, which is why like your story of your dad resonated with yeah. me as much as it did. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was cheers to dads. Cheers to dads. Cheers to dads. Yeah. That changed my life. And I learned also the art of learning to be, mm-hmm. to not associate or, or, or take any kind of, you know, worth or value in what I was doing, but just in being. And I was doing a lot as a mother. There's a it's the hardest job yeah. I've had yet, but it was a great lesson for me and exercise mm-hmm. and just be being okay, just being who I am. Well, that's why we're here. <laughs> that's right. Like, you know, one of our models at the time is no one has promised tomorrow. That's right. Um, and of course, you know, like people say that all the time, but it's uh, like, as I recently, I told you off mic about, you know, the, um, the kidney diagnosis, yes. stage four CKD, and how it's given me such a a new lease or outlook on life. And so those words really hit home with me now. Yeah. And you learn to cherish every moment, every step, every laughter. Uh, I'm no longer embarrassed to like tell my friends, hey man, love you. Uh, yeah. Cause you know, like showing any kind of vulnerability or emotion on the like black side of the aisle, we weren't raised with that. We were raised to be tough raised to be strong. Yeah. And uh, I can also credit you with a lot of that as well um, for allowing me to be vulnerable on certain things too. Cause you're like the love, but you're like a fire, you know, <laughs> you're like a fire. Um, and people are fires. Yeah, they are. If you think about it. Right. Yep. Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are, what are two things that happen with fires? One, you extinguish them. Okay. Put them out. All right. And, or? Fan them. Fan the flame. Okay. So the reason why I say people are fires is for those two reasons. If you're a person that's seeking growth, nourishment, you're going to you're going to run towards a fire. You want warmth. You want the elements that it provides. It provides food. It provides comfort, nourishment. Or you're that person that's going to try to put fire out. Because you're afraid it's going to yeah. send you, it's going to burn you, and you need it gone immediately because you're afraid of the damage that it might cause. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why we were drawn together, you know, so much because at the time, like you were a bonfire to my dumpster fire. <laughs> <laughs> I was just over there, just burning. Just I'm just going everywhere, you know. So, and well, but, I appreciated that about you. Well, uh, thank you because you helped me to be the kind of fire that would bring people in not the fire that people wanted to put out. And think about how many people miss getting warm Mm -hmm. because they're afraid of getting burned. Yeah, run away. Well, you know, I mean, one of the other things I think we've talked about is that um, after my father died, 
um, when my father was dying, I was, I've been a nurse also for 30 mm -hmm. years and, um, he asked me to be his hospice nurse. So I took care of him. And after he died, I was telling a friend of mine about my experience and she said, Oh, you were a doula. And I was like a doula as a nurse. We know doulas mm -hmm. in, in the hospital as birth doulas. You help yeah, somebody have a baby. But there is a death doula. Yeah, yeah, there is a death doula. Okay. And so I went after that and got certified and have been doing that work as well. So it's as an end of life doula. And the one thing that I will say about death that um, is so beautiful is in facing death, it mm -hmm. teaches you how to live. When you when you feel the clock running down, you you live differently. You look at life differently. And so right. I learned that. Yeah. All right. So staying there. Yeah. You recently um, lost someone very close to you, as you were telling me off mic, uh, Lucinda. And you yes. also told me about how you came to find remorse later on in life for depriving her kids of their mother during their formative years to take care of you and your brother. Yes. Tell me more. Like, let's, let's go into that. So Lucinda Bell, oh, just saying her name, is, is yeah. such a beautiful memory. I'll try my best to not cry. But uh, Lucinda Bell was an amazing woman who had 10 children. And she lived um, down Northside Drive. So I mm -hmm. guess that's what West, you know, West Jackson. Um, and she came, rode the bus in four days a week to yeah. take care. She left her 10 children to take care of two little white children. <laughs> and, and they did not like you. And her children did not like me. And I remember just being so sad, of not understanding that. Mm -hmm. And we would, get, we would go to see them Christmas. We would take gifts, we'd go over, we'd do all these things. And they just, especially her youngest children. So Georgia, her youngest is maybe 10 years older than me. So I felt this energy. And I never understood it. And I remember just feeling like, what, what did I do? What is, as I got older and I understood the gravity of what she left to come do what she did, I completely understood why they resented us. Yeah, I didn't understand it even when I saw some of your posts, because, you know, you see posts all the time where, where, um, races, even though I'm a huge component proponent of like everyone being together. Because uh, I've all, I always state we're stuck here together. Sure. Like there's nowhere you go that we can't go. There's nowhere we go that you can't go, and we have to get used to that. Uh, it wasn't until like actually getting to know you, where the feeling that I had in seeing your post, like at her funeral, and at like the wake of repast, where I was like, eh, I don't know if she's like caping for the black community. <laughs> <laughs> Or if she like, like really, Bar, yeah, if she really Mr. feels Black it. People. And it's like, but after talking to you, I was like, yeah, she truly is like, that's love. Like she really is. That's her people. And so if I can say that, can I say, well, people? uh, she, she was and her family, they are my people. Like I, and so the hardest thing for me was I can remember as a child sitting on the back of the dryer while she folded clothes and talking to her and asking her all about her family and everything and knowing like this, this person was different in my home because my, my parents were very formal people and they were, you know, on the go. My dad worked all the time. There's things going on, but Lucinda and I had a lot of time to connect and mm -hmm. I would lie and say I was sick to stay home with her and be with her. So I'm sitting on the back of the dryer asking her all about her life. And then I would see how she was treated when one of my mom's friends came over and as a child in the 70s, not understanding the climate and the culture uh, racially, what was going on still in, in Jackson, I just in, in intuitively felt like, why is my queen treated like this yeah. w among my mother and her friends? Like she's the, I mean, that woman is the reason that I am curious, the mm -hmm. reason I love education, the reason I love, I mean, she meant the world when I got married. She came down the aisle as one of my mothers. Like she was my other mother and she enriched my life. And, and it also, the biggest thing though, the biggest thing, when my dad was dying, he said, I, I, you know, I have two regrets. So I was like, okay, well, what are they? Number one, that 
I thought that I spent my life thinking that money and the and the obtaining it was mm-hmm. going to, you know, make all the difference and make everything okay. Number two, I should have paid Lucinda more. And I was like, put a should have paid Lucinda more. What do you mean by t- that? T- tell me about that. And he said, well, the going rate for a maid is what, you know, she was called in the 70s. Yeah. The, he said, I paid her the going rate. Like, and it, and it wasn't very much money. And he said, I knew it wasn't very much money, but it was what everybody was paying in, you know, Northeast Jackson. Yeah. So I paid her that. And what she was worth to me and our family, and, and it, without her, I could not have done what I did in my business. And I regret that I didn't pay her what I knew she was worth, that I went with the, you know. So, you know, for my father to have that as one of his regrets, I was like, we should pay attention to that. We should pay attention to that, you know, and it, it. Why do you think it took him so long to under, to know that it wasn't right? I think he observed what he was able to accomplish over the years and looked at her loyalty, her faithfulness to come and show up every day. She never miss a day. She did not miss one day. Do you think, okay, let me stay right there. Yeah. Do you think she didn't miss a day? Because she needed the job or she really just like loved say you and like your brother and what was. I think about three years into her job, her husband died early. And I think she didn't miss a day because she didn't want to lose her job because she had so many children to take care of. And I think because of the human that she was and Mm -hmm. because of her faith in God, too, she used to always say, baby, God put me here. He picked he picked me and your family to put us together. And yeah. it's meant to be. And I think she believed that. And so she lived and loved in such a way that she was so joyful. And she did love us because she felt like she was supposed to be there. How many, in your guesstimation, how many how many whites do you think love fried chicken based on the nanny's cooking? <laughs> <laughs> How many whites developed a love of fried chicken well, based on like I will tell you this. Black hands. I will tell you this. Our dearest friends across the street, Gray Jackson, his, you know, nanny that worked in his house, his his name was Jerry. And Jerry was known for his fried chicken. Mm-hmm. And when Jerry was cooking chicken and you could smell it, you know, coming down, all of a sudden everybody wanted to come over to his house and hang out. Yeah, because, you know, a, a lot of people make, like, the jokes about blacks and fried chicken, but white people will be just as pissed off if fried chicken were to leave. Or if somebody white's yeah, cooking it. they'll be just as pissed off. Well, so. I still go up here to, what is this, Corner Market now, mm-hmm. and the, what gives me comfort is there black ladies back there frying chicken. <laughs> I'm like, then they know what they're doing. You know they know what they're doing. Yeah. So pulling back a second, um, what do you think was the tipping point that made Lucinda's children okay with everything? Um, Lucinda, because, you know, when Lucinda died, um, this is really, it was such a beautiful experience for, um, for my brother and for me. We, she had us, she had asked that we would be seated on the front row of her church with her children. So the children of hers that were living and then the two of us were on the front row and I think what she did is told her children, these are my children too. I have raised these children. And she would talk about us. That's my baby. And mm-hmm. so I think over time, we even won Georgia over, and that was her baby. That's the hardest one. And now Georgia said, you know, sh- she loved y'all so much, and you are yeah. our family And when you need something. And, I mean, they're my favorite. And, and there since I moved back to Jackson – um, these last couple of years, that's who has reached out to me and that's who I've spent my time with and that's who I've made my memories with um, for these last couple of years. And those are my those are my people. Yeah. So it's 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 baffling to me also for it to be 2024 and for me to and, and obviously I have my limited experience and I do. I, I lived in Eastover. So it, it is a di- that's a different, you know, obviously experience. Now your so dad developed these over too, right? He well, he just did some of the building in there. I mean, no, okay. it, it was there, but but we lived we were we lived there in the seventies, and then I moved back and lived there. You know, tell me about Jackson in the seventies. On your side of the aisle. On my side of the oh gosh, well I mean, you know everybody had a maid. <laughs> um, you know what you what you wore was really important. Now maybe it's just because my parents were this way, but. 
Your Everyone clothes. had a maid. How many were as cognizant of the fact of it as you were? Well, not. I mean, there may have been people, but not many that I had conversations with. But I will tell you who I had a conversation with is Catherine Stockett, who wrote The Help. Oh, So okay. her father and my father were business partners on some real estate stuff in the city. And Catherine and I went on these horseback overnights with our dads. And we were talking one one time on one of those, and she said, you know, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to New York. And I said, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to L.A. That's right, because you told me mm-hmm. your, like your mother, her mother, and a number of your other friends were sort of like the so, catalyst for the help, so, right? Well, the help. So when we watched the help for the first time, my mother said, I think that's so-and-so. And, oh, <laughs> and I think that's so-and-so. And just, you know, she recognized a lot of those characters, and I think – that they were so when you say mm-hmm. what was it like well it was like that Catherine of all people had a you know bird's eye view and uh you know Tate Taylor did that movie and Tate and Catherine were friends and you know those people those are Jackson people and I would think that we had a pretty good idea of what was going on at that time from our little yeah. tiny corner of the woods see that's why I think that you and I connected as well as we did because if I had not gotten away from here like I did, if comedy didn't take me around the world um, and the odd jobs that I worked as well, us being able to escape this bubble that our hometown is, um, I don't want to bash them too much, but you know, they're kind of deserving, um, but it's still home. I, I think that's why you and I were able to get along so well because you wanted more for yourself and your kids. I wanted more for myself. And uh, just the two of us being able to meet, because I was middle class, uh, black kid, didn't really interact with whites uh, until I graduated college, until I started traveling. And then that's when uh, things took off for me. So I was very appreciative to meet you. Uh, And then for us to reconnect as well, because I'm telling you, you really have taught me uh, so much. Um, I think it was at your birthday party. I'm trying to remember when we went around the table and we were talking about things that we're thankful for and how we came to know you, uh, I wish I could remember what I said because it truly was off the top of my head. It was it was one of those, kind of like the way that I deal with life. Um, I will think and think and think about something and I'll take action right at the end. Uh, because for me, I needed to be true. I needed to, I needed to feel honest. And if you write and you plan and you rehearse, in my opinion, uh, it won't come off as honest because you're revising and thinking. But if you stay right there in that moment. Being present, yeah. Be present, then the words ring true. So I wish I could remember what I said. I think I think Bloss taped it or something. I think, I think but I also think that you said something about um, just being, bringing people together. Mm-hmm. Um, which is my my passion to bring people from different walks, especially different walks of life, and to be able to try to find common ground. I look I look at it like a Rubik's cube. You know, you bring mm-hmm. people together and you turn and try to find same side colors, try to get people and connect. Because if you if you will be present and put enough energy into knowing someone, you will be able to find yeah. a full color across. See, all right, we also had that interesting conversation too about. How many people, because we this is also where we're connected to, how many people are not with who they should have been with based on race? Mm, like Lord how many Jesus. Because I, I told you yes. about the special lady, I will not call her name on this. Um, she's married now. But I remember she and I, we were crazy about each other. Um, and everyone was trying to pull us mm-hmm. together, pull us apart. And so uh one of the validations that I received is her cousin came to me later on, like years after she and I had split apart and was, she told me, she was like, Hey, I just want to tell you, she really loved you. Like she really, oh, wow. and so weirdly that gave me the healing that I needed because mm-hmm. I knew she did. And I couldn't understand. I can understand obviously why, because of race, um, and I think, you know, why is interracial dating still such a thing in 2024? Why is interracial dating solely uh, focused on black and white? I mean, any race dating is interracial, you know? 
Yeah, and and I mean, I can give you maybe a potential other side of that. Um, when I was it's in here. when I was here. in nurse, I mean, when I was in nursing school in Memphis, Tennessee, I met a guy that I was just crazy about, and I we th- thought and talked about dating, mm-hmm. and I had a moment where I realized I'm not going to do this to him. I like this guy too much. He's a nice person and I'm not taking him to Jackson, Mississippi to meet my parents and my, and I just don't think that, I I mean, he's a wonderful person and I think that they're going to make him feel not so great because they're, he's black. They're not going to want me to. And, and in, in my family, just my personal experience, I think I told, we talked about this, Mm -hmm. but red lobster. So I'm 11 years old and I'm Red Lobster parking lot parking to go in and have dinner with my family. My grandmother was meeting us. Grandmother pulls in, really handsome. And I remember that being 11. Black man pulls in next to my grandmother. She gets out of the car. He gets out of his car. He's walking in. Was he more handsome than me? No, of course not. Of course not. That's good. All right. My grandmother starts screaming as she's walking through the parking lot. And she's like, Oh, help me, help me. And my dad and I are both sitting there. And I'm scared because I'm like, what is happening? And I'm, and then she's screaming. My dad is sitting there. And my dad had the most, he just looked mortified and embarrassed. And he said, mother, she was like, that man, that man. And, and my father said, mother, that man is going to have dinner just like we are. But as a child, it mm-hmm. it really made it, it really hurt me because I loved my grandmother so much. But I really felt like, what is wrong with you? Like even as I mean, I didn't even I wasn't even aware as much of the culture. So, you know, ten years later, eighties Jackson, Mississippi, the, there still was that, and it was really really hard for me because my own personal experience was that black people enriched my life so much and that I loved mm-hmm. them. And then I felt jealous of Lucinda's children because I wanted to be part of their gang. They had the best parties. They seemed to be really intimately connected and love each other and show up for each other all the time. And I love the way their family operated. So I was jealous. So I'm like, these people have something I don't have. And how are all these people in my world treating these people like they're less than I, it was hard, painful. Well, yeah, because if everything is given, it's not appreciated. But with like on the other side of the aisle, you know, you had to make do with what you had. So, you know, you can find joy in a uh, like a wet rag. You know, you just start spinning and popping each other like that's fun for the afternoon. Um, I don't know. I just I struggle with that because. I really come from like, we're all equal and I, it's hard being back here in recovery. Um, You know, I can't really go on tour now due to the, um, I have to wait until the transplant Yeah, because, you know, you have to get the four dialysis treatments in a week. Um, And so you're you're quite stationary. Um, But I cannot wait to get back out because I need to be around people more where race is not at the forefront. Yeah. Um, I've always thought it to be silly. It's just like, how can you think that you're better than someone else and you're in a lower position than they are? Uh, my dad, for instance, he uh, was fired from the bank. He was working a deposit guarantee. Uh, I was around two. He was fired in 1983 because he... Uh, entrusted his second in command. Uh, I'm not sure what you, he was a branch manager, bank manager. So I guess he trusted his branch manager to make the nightly deposit. She was a white woman. She ran off with the deposit. Uh, And he was canned and he was thrown out on his ass with, at that time he had four kids, uh, a home and everything. And so some I think most of the strength that I've had in dealing with uh, this kidney failure comes from him because he swore at that time never to work for anyone else again. He swore that no one would control his ability to make money. My dad's one of the greatest figures I know. Um, you'll meet him soon. Uh, he's going to 
I haven't had him coming on this pod because I curse and do other things. You know, he's super Christian, so I can't have him in here doing that. But um, if it wasn't for him busting his ass yeah. to put himself in a position yeah. to catch any of us when we fail, yeah. I wouldn't be here. The world would not have Dave Manners. And I feel you feel the same with your dad. Mm -hmm. And and to answer your question about Lucinda, you know, I think as my dad watched the the years progress and yet the opportunities for black women at that time, um, you know, he gained such an appreciation that, okay, these women are going to have to work even harder to get the opportunities that the white women in our in our community could could get, you know, in, in mm -hmm. Eastover, you, it's the goal. You don't work and you do the, you know, you have too much time on your hands and you helicopter parent is my personal SUV. opinion, but we won't say that, anything about that. But um, I think he, he was seeing that and watching that. And, um, and I have to say, uh, Lucinda's granddaughter, Zeta Merchant, okay. named for my mother and is now, I'm actually headed to New York City to honor her, she is being promoted as first African American female to reach the rank in the Coast Guard that she is. I am so like she has taken talk about feeling less than. She has taken my name and taken it to a whole nother level. I mean, she's a badass. Can we say that? Absolutely. Okay. Can we curse? <laughs> I, yes, you can say that. You can okay. curse, and honestly, that's the perfect note to end this on because. Cheers to her. And cheers, cheers to, to her, Zeta Merchant. And cheers to you. <laughs> and you too. It's awesome. Thank you, you so too. much. Thank you, Dave. I love being with you.